Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for braving the elements today on this cold day and joining us uh, at the Annenberg Theater. My name is John Maynard. I'm director of programs here. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege for me personally to sit down today with the legendary newsman, Bob Schieffer, who joins us today as we continue our year-long series, The President and the Press. Uh, all year, we've been exploring the Trump administration's relationship with the press, pertinent challenges to the First Amendment, and ways to protect the, flee, the free flow of information in a divided nation. Um, it was just over a year ago today when this nation and the world was stunned with the election of Donald Trump as the 45th president of the United States in arguably the biggest political upset of the modern era. Um, since that day in November, uh, Trump has radically changed the White House's relations with the news media, presenting challenges uh, never seen before between the president and the press. Uh, but even despite these challenges that Trump has delivered, uh, journalism has been changing uh, at breakneck speed in this digital age that has radically altered the way we all consume news. All of these topics and much more make up Bob's new book, Overload, Finding the Truth in Today's Deluge of News, a must-read book uh, dissecting the state of journalism in the digital age. Uh, Bob is one of America's preeminent television journalists and former host of CBS's Face the Nation. He joined CBS News in 1969. He's interviewed every president since Richard Nixon, as well as most of those who sought the office. Um, he's also moderated three presidential debates in 2004, 2008, and 2012. Uh, besides his new book, he is the author of the New York Times bestsellers This Just In and Bob Schieffer's America, as well as Face the Nation, my favorite stories from the first 50 years of the award-winning news broadcast and the acting president. He is a member of the Broadcasting Hall of Fame and in 2009 was named a living legend by the Library of Congress. So please welcome Bob Schieffer. Could, could I just say one thing? Uh, I, I had no idea that there would be this many people here today. Oh. Uh, I, I, uh, <clears throat> let me just tell you one little story about that. I, uh, some years back, made a speech. I was invited to speak at Louisiana College, which is deep in the heart of the Bayou country uh, down in Louisiana. It was a beautiful spring day, and every seat in the auditorium was filled. Kids were sitting in the aisle. It was no air conditioning, and there were these big windows that went, ran down one side of the auditorium. They'd raised the windows. Kids were sitting in the windowsill, and I looked out the window near the podium, and three boys had climbed up in a tree and were sitting on a limb <laughs> looking in uh, to hear me speak. And I was just really touched by it. And I said, you know, I can't imagine that uh, young people would come out uh, on a beautiful spring day like this to see me talk. And a kid on the front row said, it's mandatory. <laughs> so I'm sure for whatever reason you came today, nobody made you come. And I just want you to know I really appreciate that. Thank you. That's true. From what I understand, everyone here is on their own free will. That's what I, that's <laughs> exactly. what I understand. So. Well, Bob, before we get to the book, uh, you know, another slow news week, right, everyone? Yeah. Um, um, I want it's to like add, drinking out of a fire hose. There you go. There you go. We're doing um, let's start with uh, Tuesday, the off-year election. Um, and particularly what we saw in Virginia. What, what do you take from, from the results? Well, I don't think, uh, whether you like President Trump, don't like President Trump, I don't think there's very much good news in last Tuesday uh, for President Trump. Uh, and it was pretty much the same situation, uh, not just in Virginia, which we all know about. The, the big difference uh, in Virginia, you know, uh, President Trump did very well among women. Uh, much better than anyone thought he was going to do. And this time, it kind of reversed itself. And I think it was uh, white, uh, educated women uh, who really, really made the difference in that race. And uh, I think it really uh, caused people to sit back and think about it. And uh, I think, uh, you know, but what this pretends for 2020, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, what, I, what I've kind of learned during uh, this, this last year is what happens today doesn't seem to have much to do with what might happen tomorrow or what happened yesterday. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're in kind of a new kind of world now, but I, I just think the headline is bad day for yeah. Trump. And then, of course, uh, we have the news about the Alabama Senate candidate, Ray Moore, 
um, and the allegations of the improper behavior with a yeah. with a minor and, uh, and other teenagers. What's what's going to happen there? We were talking backstage. You think the election's going to continue? It's going to happen in December. Well, apparently yeah. the uh, the Alabama governor just said that she has no plans to move or postpone the election. There was some some talk of that. Uh, I. I assume what's going to happen is that the election will go off, uh, at least as of today, uh, as scheduled, and uh, people of Alabama will make up their mind. These, you know, we have to remember, these, these are not proven allegations. This, these are allegations that have suddenly come forth. Uh, I, ha I have no reason to doubt them, uh, the, the women who made these allegations, but again, I think unless there is some more evidence, unless more women come forward, and there may well be, uh, I think we'll have the election as scheduled and the people of Alabama will make up their mind about what they want to do about it. All right. I could talk news and politics with Bob all day, but um, this book is, is so important. Um, the title is Overload. Bob, what ways are we overloaded? Well, the reason I wrote the book is that uh, I was doing a series of podcasts over at CSIS, the uh, the think tank here in Washington, and concentrating mostly on uh, journalism and reporters. And I have known for a while that, uh, that this whole area of communications was really changing radically, but I didn't realize how impactful the coming of the web has been on journalism. Uh, I, I would argue right now that this technology revolution that we're going through in communications is having as profound an effect on our culture as the invention of the printing press did on the people uh, in, in Europe of that day. We all think about all the great things that came about uh, as a result of the invention of the printing press, and indeed there were. Uh, literacy improved dramatically all across the continent. Uh, we had the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation. Uh, but what we sometimes forget is that we also had 30 years of religious wars before Europe reached some sort of equilibrium. Well, we're not there yet. We're in what I kind of call the first trimester of this communications revolution that we're going through right now. And it has had both good and bad news uh, for us. Uh, the bad news is uh, it has thrown newspapers, our traditional sources of news in this country for hundreds of years, into a real crisis, especially at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the lower end. Some of the big newspapers, and we'll talk about this later, the Times and the Post, have totally reinvented themselves to live in this new world, and they're doing okay. But at some of the smaller towns, uh, we have lost 126 newspapers in the last 12 years. And here's a statistic that I, I was stunned when I found it out, and I didn't know this going into it. In 2004, one reporter in eight lived in New York, Washington, or Los Angeles. That number is down to one reporter in five. One reporter in five in this country lives in one of those three metropolitan areas. So what you're seeing, and especially out through the middle of the country now, it's not a question, you know, we argue about biased news and slanted news. It's not a question of biased or slanted news in, in many areas of this country now. It's a question of no news. Mm -hmm. There is no reliable source of information there, and we're seeing more and more people in uh, those parts of the country depending almost solely now on, on, uh, on uh, social media. Uh, Facebook uh, is now... We now know that at least when I started writing this book, 62% of Americans were getting some of their news on Facebook, and I think by the time I finished it uh, uh, this spring, it was down to 67% uh, uh, now getting their news on Facebook. Facebook, social media, these are wonderful mediums. I mean, to keep up with your family, to keep up with your kids, to keep up with your neighbors. There are any number of ways that social media has enriched our lives, but what we have to remember is that everything that pops up on Facebook has not been vetted, has not been edited in the way that the uh, information we once got from our newspapers and our local television stations is. In other words, uh, at CBS News, we don't print or broadcast anything until we check it out and determine if it's true. 
That does not happen on social media. Uh, it just pops up there. Uh, when I was coming into the business, we used to say, uh, you know, there was a big argument over whether journalists ought to be licensed like doctors and lawyers. And we said, no, no, that's not right. Uh, the First Amendment is our license. So if you've got a barrel of ink and you've got a printing press, you're a publisher. You don't need a license. You're a publisher. Well, now think about it. You don't need the barrel of ink. You don't need the printing press. Everybody who's got a phone is now a publisher, has access to the media, and the ability to transmit information that goes around the world and back in a matter of seconds. You know, and, and the dangerous part, of course, is that Mark Twain once said, a lie can travel around the world in the back while the truth is still putting his pants on. Mm -hmm. Now more than ever is that true, and we're seeing that happening. And the result is we're overwhelmed with all of this information. Think about this. We have access to more information now than any people who've ever lived on the earth at any one time. But are we wiser or are we simply overwhelmed? with so much information we can't process it. And I think most of the time we're simply overwhelmed. So what are the kind of the responsibilities of, of Facebook uh, and Twitter? What, what steps can they take and or should they well, be forced to? Well, up until about six weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, Facebook uh, would say with a straight face, we're not a media company. Right. We're a technology company. We can't be responsible for the content that is produced through our technology. Well, wait a minute, 62, 67% of the American people are depending, and some people this is their only source of news, depending on Facebook uh, for information, for news, and they say we have no responsibility for what appears on our pages. Now, the good news is they have come to uh, change that under enormous pressure. They now admit they're going to have to do something about this. They're talking about doing things like hiring a 1,000 editors, bringing humans back into the process uh, to, to edit this stuff. But it's also a very, very difficult problem because, you know, you can't censor legitimate political dialogue. Nobody would want to do that. Uh, you, you can't. You don't want to do away with irony. That's a great part of our, our culture. Uh, how, how do you do it? And I think what's going to happen is they're going to wind up getting some sort of government regulation, uh, which had they acted on this problem earlier, they may not have faced. But the other part is, how do you regulate it? What do you regulate? It's an extremely serious problem because, uh, you know, we just now have this ability to produce news and transmit news. Everybody who has a phone can do that, and 80% of us will have phones by, I think, 2020. Uh, and so it's just an enormous problem, and uh, I think in the end, I think it will strengthen our culture as advances in technology always do, but we're nowhere near the end here. We're nowhere near reaching any kind of equilibrium, and until we do, uh, this is going to continue to have an enormous impact uh, on our culture, and no two institutions in our culture have been more impacted than our politics, and the way we get our news, right. journalism. Right. I want to ask you about kind of the timing of, of the book. Um, w w were you planning this book anyway in the last, you know, last year, last year and a half, or did the unprecedented campaign and, and election and even what's happened since kind of affect how you approached the writing? You know, uh, kind of all of the above, but the, the, the really the, uh, what really got us thinking about this is uh, Andrew Schwartz, who's the chief of communications over at, uh, at CSIS, and was working with me doing these podcasts every week. And, and one day we were having uh, coffee with Dr. John Hamry, who's the uh, head of, of CSIS, and he's a former defense official. Uh, it was Deputy Secretary of Defense during the Obama administration, and, and truly uh, what people in that community would call a defense intellectual. And he said, you know, uh, this idea of not being able to get accurate information, he said, I think it's so serious that it's become a national security issue. Mm -hmm. And I got to thinking about it, and we got to thinking about it, and, and uh, I thought, you know, maybe this, this is worth doing a book. And I knew this was a serious problem when I got into this book, uh, but I didn't realize how serious it was. And what I did in the book 
is we just, uh, and we did much of the basic reporting in these podcasts, but we would just talk to everybody we could in journalism. I did an interview with the editor of the Washington Post, the bureau chief of the uh, New York Times here, the guy that runs BuzzFeed. I mean, because there are all these news sources out on the, uh, out on the web now, some of which are very, very good, and some of which are, are simply uh, propaganda outlets. And as we're now finding propaganda outlets for propagandists, both domestic uh, and foreign. And if I could just talk a little bit about that. There is, we have known for some time, and all of our intelligence agencies have known for some time, that the Russians have been meddling in our, in our politics and in our business. Now, whether they're in collusion with Donald Trump or not, uh, I'm going to leave that to uh, Mr. Mueller, who's doing that <laughs> investigation, to right. find out. But what I do know is they've been very active. Joe Nye, who is a defense uh, uh, expert up at Harvard, says he thinks that the Russians were simply trying to destabilize our institutions and maybe got Trump as a bonus. Now, those are his words, not mine. But I kind of tend, I kind of tend to agree with him on that. What we do know that the Russians were very active in hacking into our election systems, and now we're coming to find out what a heavy role they have been playing in social media. Uh, in the recent uh, congressional hearings, uh, Facebook executives admitted that 126 million Americans were exposed to some kind of content on Facebook that had come directly from Russian intelligence agencies disguised as domestic outlets for news. Uh, I was just down in Texas as part of this book tour last week and found out about a new one called Heart of Texas. This, this uh, popped up on the web uh, during the campaign in 2016 and urged Texans to secede from the union. And this became uh, quite an active uh, thing down there, and there was an active secession movement. It obviously didn't go very far, but it involved uh, numbers of people. It turns out the heart of Texas was not a website founded by Texans, but by Russians. <laughs> it was a Russian intelligence site. There is another one called Patriotic Americans, uh, which urged white people to kill black people who disrespect the flag. Again, this was a Russian site, we now know. There was another, another one called Blacktivist, which urged black people to kill white people if they felt they had been disabused, uh, been abused by the police. These were obviously websites designed to try to raise credibility issues to turn Americans against Americans, and I hate to sound like one of these people from back in the 50s, you know, in the old House Un-American Activities Committee days and all of that, when we were talking about Russian dupes and all that sort of thing. But the Russians are very, very active. And I mean, there's, there's no question about it. We, in the testimony on Capitol Hill two weeks ago, we actually learned that some of these Russian organizations bought ads on Facebook and paid for them in rubles. Now, wouldn't you kind of think maybe if I connect that dot, this dot, that we might be onto something here? There's no question about it. They are actively doing it, and, and what adds credibility to it is what they're doing here is no different than what they're doing across Central Europe. Uh, across Europe these days, uh, the Russians do not drive their tanks across the borders anymore. They found a much more efficient uh, way to do it, which is also much cheaper. They use cyber warfare. They go in, they bribe the local officials. They make sweetheart deals with the local real estate operators, loan them money and so on. Uh, and they're doing this, and they're exercising more and more control over some of these independent countries that had once been in the Soviet orbit and, and part of the Soviet Union before its collapse. This is what they're doing, and they've been doing this for the last five or six years, and now it's beginning to show up here. Right, right. Um, I want to get back to, you brought up uh, your conversations in this book with Marty Barron of the Washington Post, yeah. uh, uh, and New York Times, Wall Street Journal. They're all setting all sorts of records, uh, correct, in terms of the digital viewership, for sure. Yeah. You also devote a chapter, which I, I really enjoyed, about the Texas Tribune. Yeah. 
Uh, tell us what, what they're doing and what, what excites you about the, the, the Tribune. Well, I'll talk to you. Uh, let's talk first about the Texas yeah, Tribune because yeah, yeah, yeah. it is very exciting. Uh, Evan Smith, who was the longtime editor of Texas Monthly, which was the leading magazine, you know, it was, when was it, 25 years ago when these local magazines like the Washingtonian and New York Magazine came about, and Texas Monthly started, and it was all about Texas. It was a great magazine. And... Uh, uh, had uh, you know really in-depth reporting and also one of the best place to get a hamburger and all of that. <laughs> but uh, Evan Smith stepped down as editor of Texas Monthly and formed this thing that he called Texas Tribune. And frankly, a lot of people, including me, thought he was completely nuts to do it. <laughs> he, he had made a great success of the magazine. I mean, when visiting reporters during campaigns would come to Texas, the first place they stopped was to talk to him to find out what the latest news was on Texas politics. He formed uh, this, uh, this company, which was a nonprofit. He went out and raised his own funds. He got no government money and put together this team of reporters based in Austin whose only job was to cover the Texas legislature and the Texas government. Uh, probably a staff of 40 people, maybe, uh, in the beginning. And then once they did their reporting, they wrote stories and gave them away to anybody that wanted them. In other words, if you were, you know, uh, the El Paso Times or you're the Wichita Falls Record News and you didn't have a correspondent covering uh, state government, they just send you their stories. And, and they, they were excellent. They did, no, they did not do any editorials or opinion pieces. But they are now servicing about half, well, probably more than that, of the uh, newspapers in Texas. Because there are many newspapers in Texas now that because of the economic straits they find themselves in, can no longer afford to send a correspondent to Austin uh, to cover the state legislature. What has happened, of course, to these, these newspapers is when the web came along and the advertising revenue that was their life's blood and kept them operating, that all went away to eBay and to other places on the web, and they simply are having a very, very difficult time in, in, uh, in finding a business model that they can still hire the kind of staff to do the kind of reporting we used to expect from our local newspapers. So in Texas, Evan Smith is really filling a void with the Texas Tribune. There's another organization like that uh, in the East called uh, ProPublica. They're doing much the same things, but these are, these are very much like uh, uh, NPR or public broadcasting, but without uh, the government funds. And uh, it's, it's just an amazing thing that's taking place, and uh, it really has uh, helped uh, the, uh, the newspapers in Texas. And just to give you an example, of how strapped these newspapers are now uh, because they don't have this advertising revenue that they once did. Uh, it's in 20, uh, let me think, yeah, in 21 of the 50 states, there is not a single newspaper that has a Washington correspondent anymore. That's, that's how, how tough it is for these local papers. Up in South, uh, South Dakota, which is not a large state, but the entire Capitol press corps in the capital of South Dakota is one reporter, yeah. the Associated Press. There's not a single newspaper in the whole state that, that covers their own state. See, what's, what's, so what's the, what's the greatest danger of well, that? Well, this is the real crisis in journalism right now, as I see it, and, the real, and I think it's, it's a very serious problem for our country. If we ever reach the point where we don't have some entity in these towns and cities across America, uh, some entity that does what we have come to expect from local newspapers, and that is to cover the local officials. We'll have corruption like we've never seen, and at levels we've never seen all across the country. And so it is, it is just essential that we find some way uh, to, you know, to improve this situation. Now, I think the lessons and the good news in all of this is, is the pattern that's starting with the Washington Post, uh, once, it was born, uh, once it was bought by Jeff Bezos, uh, has shown us, and, and the New York Times is right behind them. 
they're no longer just newspaper companies. They have, they have converted themselves into media companies. Uh, the Washington Post uh, used to uh, put out a newspaper once a day. It was, uh, you know, it was a morning newspaper. Everybody came to work about noon, uh, which is the hours you work when you're putting out a, uh, uh, a morning newspaper. Uh, New York Times did the same thing. Now, the, both the Post and the Times are putting their reporting on maybe as many as six different platforms. I wrote an op-ed piece uh, during the uh, campaign last year on the role of a, of a moderator of a presidential debate. So I wrote the piece. Uh, I sent it to them. It showed up the next day on their uh, digital uh, outlet. It stayed there for a couple of days, and then it went away. And then I called uh, Ruth Marcus, who's the assistant editorial page editor, and I said, is that it? Is that done? She said, oh, no, no, we have a nice uh, spot reserved for you on the op-ed page uh, in, the, in the Sunday paper, so it'll be there. So that was two different, uh, two different outlets. And then somebody from the Post video department, and yes, the Washington Post now has a video department, and they called and said, listen, we pulled some uh, sound bites from three or four presidential debates that you did, and why don't you come down and, and we'll play them and, and you can do a little commentary about them. And they put together a, a video package and that went out on their, on their video service. And then uh, before it was over, I think that story that I wrote was on five different platforms. <laughs> and that's what the Post is doing. Now here's the thing, and Jeff Bezos, when he, when he bought the Post, uh, he told him, I want you to make this the best newspaper in America. And he had who I consider to be the best newspaper editor in America, uh, and that is Marty Barron. And the good news is he let Marty do it. He said, you know, I'll run the business, uh, you run the newspaper, and uh, that's what they've done. But where the circulation of the Washington Post, the paper newspaper that, that we get at home, is about 400,000, with this heavy concentration on their media, on their, on their digital product, they are now some months reaching as many as 70 million people around the world. And it's this, this shift and this new emphasis on digital has, uh, is as and is making the Washington Post into an international paper, whereas before it was pretty much a, uh, uh, a domestic paper, a very you know influential domestic paper, but certainly not even a national paper on the on the scale of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the New York Times is doing much the same thing, uh, and the good news is, is that the uh, Post has been in the black for the last two years. They hired 30 reporters this year, which is unheard of for for a, a newspaper to be hiring uh, in those kind of numbers lately. So they're making a go of it and. I think there are a lot of lessons for people at the local les level here uh, to learn. I, I, I hate myself for saying it uh, because I love to get up in the morning and, and go get the newspaper and sit down and have my coffee and I read three newspapers at home, the Post, the Times, and the Wall Street Journal, and then I get up and go to work. But, I mean, but that's generational. That's just the way I do it. My daughters still read the paper, but my granddaughters, of course, they get all their news on the phone. Uh, so that's changing. I think we've spent in journalism maybe more time than we should have worrying about what the newspaper has been printed on. And it's not a question of whether it's printed on paper or whether it's printed uh, on, on your digital phone. What's important is the content there. And if local newspapers are going to succeed, if they do go to digital, uh, it has to be a better product than when they're putting out in their in their paper version. And the newspapers, again, have to become a part of the community. And uh, that is what has always made uh, local, uh, local news work in the past. And, it, and again, it'll be the test. So the good news is uh, the Post and the Times have figured out how to, how to survive in this new world we're in. Uh, much of journalism is still struggling with it. Um, we're going to get to uh, audience questions in, in just a moment. We have two microphones on either side. So I just wanted to, um, I want to, the subtitle of the book is, you know, Finding the Truth in Today's del del Deluge of News. What would be your advice um, to news consumers, and in particular our, our younger news consumers, like my 15-year-old son whose phone I think is physically connected to his hand <laughs> at this point? 
Um, what, what kind of advice would you give? Well, <clears throat> number one, uh, the obvious buyer beware. Uh, be aware of where this information is coming from. When you Just because you read something on your phone, do not assume that it's true. To the contrary, it's probably false. Uh, know the sources that you're getting your news from. Uh, just as an example of this, how horrendous this situation is with this fake news now, and my definition of fake news is different from Donald Trump's uh, yeah. definition of fake news, yeah. but that's fine. Uh, it's a term but, that's gotten distorted over the yeah, last but, year. Uh, you know, after that horrible thing that happened out in, uh, in Las Vegas, within, I would say, a half hour, there were reports, uh, I got one on my phone, that he, had, he was a recent convert to Islam, and an even greater sin, he was a fan of Rachel Maddow. <laughs> yeah. God forbid. And yeah, I, 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 I called the office, and I didn't ask about the Rachel Maddow uh, allegation, but I said, listen, it's, I'm reading here that he recently converted to Islam. Is that? They said, no, it's totally without foundation. It's just made up out of whole cloth, and the FBI and the local police have, have already denied that. But here that story had gone around the world you know, uh, before, before it could be corrected. And this has been going on uh, for a while. I mean... Uh, it re we really began to notice it after, uh, uh, during, not on the day of 9-11, when I can't tell you how many times in the Washington Bureau we'd get a report that there was another plane headed toward the Sears Tower in Chicago. Now, the rule in journalism up until that point was that if you made a mistake, uh, it was your responsibility cor to correct it. But if your co competitor made a mistake, you depended on them to correct it. You just simply ignored it. Well, we found out on 9-11, you couldn't do that anymore because if you let these, these uh, stories that were totally wrong, uh, if you left them out there, uh, you could cause pandemonium and, and literally panic in the streets. So we took on a new responsibility that day, not only to report the news as accurately as we could, but to correct the news that was not right the, the tragedy is that once the stuff is out there, it's almost impossible to completely erase it. I mean, I would just yeah. say as an example, the, the allegation that Barack Obama was not born in the United States. I mean, there's still a percentage of people in this country who believe that uh, he is a Muslim and that he was not born in America. Well, how much fact-checking do you have to do to knock that down? You can never completely erase these things. Uh, once they're out there, the uh, I'll, and I'll just close with this example: uh, this this thing at the ping pong pizza parlor out there on Connecticut Avenue, and you all know about that. Uh, the allegation that Hillary Clinton was running a child pornography ring in the basement, and uh, it was completely discredited, uh, absolutely without foundation. But someone still came with a rifle from out of state and shot one of the doorknobs off the door because he was going down into the basement to save those children. Well, as we know, and as he found out, there is no basement in the place. He was taken away. He's now in the criminal justice system. But the man who owns that pizza parlor still has to hire a private security because uh, he's still getting death threats. It's a story that once out there, it just won't go away. And that's, that's the really serious part here. Before we get to our first question, and I do invite people to line up on either side here to, to, to take your questions. I just want, you spoke at the museum um, earlier this year as part of the kickoff program mm -hmm. for this very series, the President and the Press. And dur during your, your great talk, you, you said the question you were most asked during last year's presidential campaign was, have you ever, have you ever seen a campaign like this? Yeah, and and <laughs> how, did you, how did you answer that? No. No, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> That's the yeah, short answer. Yeah, yeah. Because as this, we're in the midst of this communications revolution, I think the chickens finally came home to roost in our electoral system and how we select uh, the people uh, that, that wind up as our candidates for office. Uh, and that, that's, the system is so overwhelmed by money uh, there are so many things wrong with it. We have made running for office so odious that our best and brightest people simply don't want anything to do with it. And, and we have got to change that. We have got to find a way to clean this thing up. And I mean, that's a whole other book. But 
I'll just give you one example, and then we'll go to the questions. When I was a little boy, my grandmother thought I was going to be president of the United States. And you know why she thought that? Because that's what every grandmother thought about their grandson. And now I ask you this question. How long has it been since you've run into anybody who says, I hope my child grows up to be a politician? And that is the greatest indictment of all as to what we've allowed our, our electoral system to become. And until we change that, uh, we're going to continue to have these problems. Question. Hello. Um, so apparently there's no legal, li legal responsibility for a politician to say things that they know aren't true. But as far as the press goes, is there any legal li liability that they have for saying things that they know are true? And do they have any legal liability for confirming things that they seem too outrageous to be true to actually check that? Is there any liability at all? Well, uh, the liability is if you work for CBS like I do, uh, which is a company that has deep pockets, if you say something that's, um, you liable someone in some way, they have, they have recourse. They can sue you. Uh, and so, so that's the recourse. But in this world we're living in now, uh, these things can pop up. You don't know where they came from. Uh, you don't know uh, who said it. Uh, you don't know who that person is. It may be just some kid living in his mother's basement. Well, how are you going to sue him if you find him? He doesn't have anything, and yet he has access uh, to the web, uh, as, as, as we all do. And so that, that's what makes this, this all so difficult. And many, in many cases, these allegations are made, and there's no recourse for the person who has been libeled. I mean, uh, when I was a young reporter down in Fort Worth, <clears throat> about 10 days out from every election, uh, we get a report that somebody had a girlfriend out on the east side. Well, you know, I don't know why, but all the girlfriends seem to live on the east side. And <laughs> everybody else lives someplace else. And we go check them out. Uh, you know, there was these whispering campaigns. Most of the time, 98% of the time, there was nothing to it, and we, we did nothing about it. But now, uh, with the coming of the web, there, there is no longer a whisper campaign. If somebody wants to make up something mean about somebody else, they just simply uh, put it on the web. They, they put it in a blog. And then that person, uh, it, it's more of a problem for the person running for office than it is for those of us in journalism. We just use that for a tip sheet. And uh, you know, if it's not, we check it out. If it's not true, we forget about it. But that person has to decide, do I ignore this and just hope it goes away? Do I uh, deny it and give it wider circulation? You, you're just put in a, in a terrible position, and it's just another of those things that make it much more difficult for a person to decide to, to run for public office, and that's, that's one of the problems we're all dealing with. Yes, sir. Um, hi. I was uh, wondering, uh, as far as uh, you were mentioning about uh, 21 states or so where people are not working for newspapers anymore, or kind of a, a dirt No, 21 states. 21 states. There, there's uh, not a single newspaper okay. in the state that has a Washington correspondent. Okay. So do, are you finding or do you know, is there less people um, majoring in journalism these days, or are they now heading for like online outlets? You, know, you have people like Katie Couric you know, now on uh, Yahoo News instead what, of What's interesting, network. there are a lot of jobs, and, and one of the things that I did in this book, I make a list of what I call reputable news sites, places where that, that follow the traditional journalistic uh, check it out, don't publish in, unless you're sure it's true, and all of that all of that kind of thing. Uh, but the interesting thing is, as happened during Watergate, uh, there was a big boom in, in journalism schools. Everybody decided they wanted to be Woodward and Bernstein. And I mean, it really was, uh, it really did cause uh, uh, enrollment to go up in journalism schools. And we're seeing a little of that right now, uh, same thing. Uh, what I tell these uh, young people going into journalism, there, there are still jobs out there, and journalism still needs you, and, and there are still uh, places where you can find uh, real serious work, I mean, you know, and be a real reporter. It may not always be on a newspaper anymore, but there are these entities out there. And so uh, uh, right now, journalism, as far as kids going into journalism, is doing 
doing pretty good. The book also has a great list of, uh, you say, reputable news sites, but also great podcasts that you listen to and that are, yeah. that are great. It's a, a terrific book. Go ahead. Yeah. There are many of us uh, here, myself included, who at one time or another have taken an oath of office, either to the military or, sure. or government or whatever. Um, today it's appropriate, I think, to thank you for your service. Well, thank you. You didn't have to take an oath, but I think you've done as much and, and your colleagues have done as much to uphold the various amendments in the Constitution against all enemies, foreign, domestic, and so on. My question to you is, particularly for young people, uh, not everybody's going to be a journalist, but everybody is a consumer. Yeah. Is there some way in some program, and does it exist anywhere where schools are actually teaching young people how to deal with this? Uh, I, th I, I think so. And, uh, and in journalism schools, the big emphasis that uh, the journalism school down at TCU where I went to school, our emphasis is on ethics, on ethics. And I, I'm, I mean, this, if I could have a wish, it would be that everyone who goes to college takes two ethics courses, one just on general ethics and then one on whatever discipline they choose uh, to follow, like if you're going into business, business ethics, journalism, journalism ethics. But I think that's very important. And you know, it's kind of corny to say, you know, you need to, you know, try to do what your your kindergarten teacher or your mom told you when you were about five or six years old. You don't steal, you don't lie, you know, and all that kind of thing. Uh, but that's what this country is all about, and that's what this country, uh, what has made this country what it is. And uh, I, I still think that that feeling is out there. But let me just say this about the role uh, of journalists uh, in our society. You know, we're always pictured by whoever is in, in power as that we're trying to be the opposition party or we're trying to run things or we know more about things than anybody else. Uh, that's, that's not what drives most people in journalism. Uh, the role of the journalist is simply this. The politician delivers a message. It's our job, our responsibility, not to deliver another message, but to check out that message and see if it's true or false and then report to the people it's going to impact on uh, what we have found out about it. And that's the difference in our form of government in a totalitarian society where the only news source is the government. We give people independently gathered information that they can compare to the government's version of events and then decide what to do about it. And uh, if we do that, uh, we're doing something that is as crucial to democracy as the right to vote. And I think always what we need to remind ourselves, we're not there to deliver a message. We're there to check out the message that they're being given by the people uh, who run their government. Yes, ma'am. Oh, we'll go in this side. Is oh, this time? Yeah, go ahead. Well, you're very polite. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to you next. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Schieffer, for taking oh, okay. time out to come see us today. We appreciate it. The EPA right now is being run by a cabinet member whose entire career prior seems counter to the mission of the agency. And there are reports that he's locked down the entire floor where his office is. Having said that, my question is, what's the impact of the current climate on specifically investigative journalism? Well, actually, I think it has spurred us, spurred us on. I mean, I think, uh, I think we saw some great journalism during this, uh, this campaign. Uh, I think we're still seeing some, some great journalism. I mean, one of the things that I'm enjoying, and, and it, it's kind of funny, really. I mean, those of us in journalism get a kick out of it. We all recognize that our credibility uh, depends on being accurate, and, and we have to be transparent. We have to be as transparent as we possibly can. And that's why you'll see now in the Washington Post, where it used to be a story that says, sources say, 
you'll now see a, a, a sentence. 17 sources <laughs> reported. Yeah. You know, I mean, and we, we, for a while in our newsroom, we had a little thing up on the wall, you know, at 17. We got past 17. We <laughs> put another one up, 18. But, I mean, that's a good thing. And, and that's, uh, that's a good thing. And, and uh, you know, most newspapers now, you'll see at the bottom, uh, there'll be somebody's email where you can email the reporter if you have a comment. And obviously, uh, with the stuff that's coming on the web, uh, the same thing, but I mean, I would just say to you about you know your your example about the EPA and so forth. Elections have consequences, and uh, we're we're seeing that. Uh, there's no question about that. But it's our job to just keep reporting on what they do. That's that's what we do, and uh, that we will not always be the most popular person in the room, uh, and we shouldn't be. But, but that's our role, and that's the assignment that the founders gave us under the, uh, when they authored the First Amendment. So I'm very proud to be a part of that. I'm going to play that's traffic cop. We've got two questions here and three there, so okay. we'll make those the final five, and then we're going to have Bob sign books after. Okay. So go ahead. Thanks for taking my question. Um, so there are pros and cons to receiving timely updates of news, but I'm of the personal opinion that the 24-hour news cycle has been damaging uh, to public information because um, a lot of broadcast media tends to blur the line or completely erase the line between fact and opinion. Um, so where you get pundits who are giving their opinion or you know, sometimes just flat out giving misinformation um, come on these broadcasts, the public doesn't know what to believe and in fact digest the information differently. Um, so I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on the 24-hour news cycle and also um, perhaps its interplay with social media. Well, it's, uh, I, I agree with you. I, I agree with a great deal of what, what you just said. Uh, but what's happened is, and I don't know quite how we control this, I, I don't think we should pass a law that say you can only have news at 5.30 every afternoon and, and it's 7 o'clock in the morning. I, I kind of think access to the information. But the other part is that sometimes, and I, th I think you're right sometimes about there has been a blurring of, of, uh, of opinion and, and just straight factual reporting. And sometimes I think it is in an effort to provide balance, uh, uh, especially for the cables where, you know, you're going to have somebody that's kind of on one side and somebody that's on the other. Well, what I found during the uh, campaign, a lot of times, and especially with the Trump campaign, when you'd have people that uh, were said to be, you know, Republican strategists or something like that, well, what is that? Someone that get put out a yard sign in the last election or something? <laughs> you know, all strategists are not equal. All advocates are not equal. And I think uh, sometimes, I mean, Trump just kind of came out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, there were these people that, claimed to be Trump supporters, and I, I often wondered if they'd ever talked to Donald Trump or if they'd ever talked to anybody in his top command. But, you know, I think that kind of sorts itself out. I mean, uh, you don't have to listen to people sometimes very long to understand they don't know what they're talking about. And <laughs> people are not stupid. Our, our viewers and readers are not stupid for the most part. And, and so I think the governor on that is just the credibility of the people who are there. And so uh, what, what happens is it's just on all the time, and that's, it just wears you out. And that's, that's the part that I think all of us are kind of dealing with. And frankly, I, I don't know how you ever, how you ever uh, resolve that, but uh, it's just kind of the world we live in now. You know, the golf course we play on, as I, as I say. Yes, sir. Uh, you described the limits and changes of the new media uh, the new technology on, on print, uh, and specifically newspapers. Could you uh, describe a little further about the impact on your own uh, uh, area, which is uh, uh, national broadcast, yeah. and then continuing on, on uh, a follow-up on, on local, uh, could you describe local, and specifically on local, could you uh, comment on the uh, uh, growing uh, uh, power of uh, Sinclair Broadcasting? You know, I... I've got to find out something. I don't know that much about Sinclair Broadcasting. I know they own Channel 7 here, and I know, but I don't know 
uh, I don't know a great deal about them, but I do know that uh, they are they see themselves as playing a larger role here in exactly what that is. Uh, I don't know yet, uh, but you know you're having some very interesting things going on now because our our political parties are much weaker than they they have ever been. I mean, fewer people now identify. They see the Democrats are Republicans. I think you're seeing the Republican Party could very well break right in two uh, here. And, and while it's not in very good shape, I would think the Democratic Party is in even worse shape, although they had got a little shot in the arm here uh, with these, uh, these uh, elections uh, last week. I, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, in 2020 we had four candidates. We'll see. But that, that's just my opinion. But, uh, uh, and you're seeing the rise of people on both the left and the right. Most of the activity now seems to be on the right, where you've got Sinclair Broadcasting, which now sees itself as a player, and you have the Mercer family, uh, which is uh, who basically Steve Bannon represents. They're rising up to challenge the Koch brothers, who they think are too liberal. Uh, <laughs> And so you have all that going on. So there, there's just a lot of turmoil going on right now on, on both sides of the aisle here. And frankly, I, I don't know how all this shakes down. And that, and that earlier point about the impact of the technology on, on broadcast specifically. Yeah, C C well, C I mean, and the like. you know, uh, when I came into, you know, when I, in my salad days when I came to work at CBS, there were three television stations in every town, and every town had a couple of newspapers, one newspaper, maybe sometimes they had two, and uh, that pretty much, uh, it was a much more orderly way. There, were, there was, uh, we were getting news, but it was kind of curated by those, uh, those organizations. Now, when you have 600 channels on the television, and when you have uh, more websites than that, uh, on in the digital world, we're getting this information from, you know, a thousand places where we used to get it from, from four or five places. What's what's different now is if you, if you, in those days, we all got our information from a limited number of sources, and those facts is what we based our opinions on. Now, if you listen to a source over here, you're going to get one set of facts, and you get a source over here, and it's another set of facts. So we're no longer forming our opinions on common data. We're getting different sets of facts, and that's one of the reasons, I think, that we have this uh, enormous divide that we have. But the country is, I, I would think right now that our country is more divided than any time that I can remember since 1968 when literally the country almost came apart. It didn't, and we can all be thankful for that. But I think we're, we're right in, in that territory right now. Thank you. The, the last question on that last side, question. we have two more on this side. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming. Um, I, I do believe that the biggest threat to journalism is the decline of local news sources. Um, yeah. And I guess I'm, I want to hear what you think the best revenue model is for news companies. Is it a subscription model that delivers hyper local news where someone could learn about yeah. their local politician but also get notified about if their street is closing down. Yeah, what I, I think it has to be something on the order of what the Washington Post is doing where they'll probably have to go to digital, but the digital product has got to be better than the paper product right now. Uh, my boss at CBS News says if you have some information that other people believe they need, you can get a rent for that. And, and that's, that's how uh, private enterprise journalism works. We know something you need to know. And if you, can, if you can figure out what that is, and I think it's pretty simple. People want to know if they're safe. They want to know if their taxes are being wasted. They want to know if their schools are being run correctly. They, they want to know if their streets need paving or not. Uh, if you can provide that information to people, uh, then you, you can find a way to uh, to make money off that, which these have to be, these have to be successful businesses. It can't be something that depends on the government for subsidies and things like that. So I think they can, there is a way to do that. Perhaps it'll be something like CBSN, which CBS has created. We have this 24-hour news service. It's not cable, 
but you get it on your phone or you get it on your computer. You don't get it on your television station. We found times during the uh, political conventions in 2016 when we were getting more viewers on CBSN than we were on the network. So I, I, there, are, there are things, maybe something at the local level like that uh, can be created. Uh, I think there are a variety of ways that we can do this, but again, you know, I went to a conference uh, this summer where Jeff Bezos spoke, and I thought what he said hit right home, even in the competitive world of journalism. He said, too many times businesses think too much about their competition and not enough about their customer. And I think that's uh, a very profound statement when you stop and think about it. That's what newspapers at the local level or some entity at the local level has to do. They have to think about what does the news consumer need and how can I get it to them? You know, when Bezos took over the Washington Post, he said, you know, uh, it, there's no question that this, this whole web thing has hit newspapers really hard. But he said, let me remind you of something. It provides a great way to get news from your newspaper to the customer. He said, that's what you're spending most of your money on, is a printing press and trucks to, to haul the newspaper out and deliver it. He said, there's a way now to get it to them, and it costs you practically nothing. And he said, we have to figure out how to take advantage of that. And I think that's what, I think that's what newspapers have to do. Yes, sir. I wanted to ask you about the, uh, the, the daily briefings we get from the White House, first from Sean Spicer and then uh, yeah. Sarah Huckabee Sanders. And it's very disheartening to watch these and see the constant lying that's going on. Yeah. When Trump is out of the White House, do you think we'll ever get back to that healthy adversarial relationship that the press corps has with the White House, or do you yeah. think he's damaged it forever? You know, White House press briefings have, have not amounted to very much for a long, long time, to be quite frank. You know, one of the interesting things, and I didn't know this, and I know both of the reporters very well, but I didn't know uh, until I started doing this book that Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein never attended a single White House briefing during the entire Watergate uh, story while it was going on. They just went out to people's houses at night and knocked on the doors. <laughs> probably, Nobody had been they, doing it. probably that. weren't welcome. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, when they go through this rigmarole like they did at the start of this, we may not have the briefings or we may have them across the street. My word was fine. Tell us where it is and we'll show up. But you don't need, you know, you don't get much news there. I mean, I think what I would do if I were covering this White House, I'd send a kid with a clipboard to, do, to go to the briefing, and I'd have my reporters talking to people and, and, and doing other things. But you have to have it to get them on the record. But uh, these are some of the worst briefings we've ever had, but that's in a long line of not very good briefings down through the years. So I'm not too worried about that. But it's a good question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Final, Final question. question. Um, I feel like it's become uh, more and more common, especially um, from people who are in uh, the public eye, to call and label fake news on articles that they just don't like or don't like the yeah. um, angle of. And I'm wondering what impacts you think this has on articles that are true being labeled as fake news. I know even like a couple of Washington Post headlines this week got called out as fake news. Um, and uh, what, I guess, uh, trust or yeah. is lost in that? Yeah, I, I do think it has an impact, and, and it has a negative impact. I mean, you know, after all, the president is the president, whoever he might be. He was elected president of the United States, and when he has something, his words carry weight. And when he calls things uh, fake news, there are a certain number of people that are going to just take him at his word, and others will say, well, maybe he's right, and so forth. And you know, I, uh, I've been a reporter for a long, long time, and I've been called every name you could be called. I mean, I, you know, came here when President, uh, Vice President Agnew was calling us nattering nabobs of negativity. <laughs> and uh, during the last campaign, I was called a female hygiene device. <laughs> so I, I've been called everything. You know, but that's just part of the that's just part of the job. We no, none of us worry about that. But when people try to destroy our credibility and try to do it on purpose, that does concern me. And I don't care if it's uh, someone at the highest office in the land or some kid in the darkest corner of his mother's basement. You know, when you try to destroy a free press 
you are attacking a foundation of our democracy. And so I think all of us have, we shouldn't take ourselves that seriously, but all of us have to take that seriously and understand it for what it is, because it does have an impact. And uh, none of us want a, a country where the only news comes from the government. And uh, so we, we have to, but the way we fight that, somebody asked Marty, uh, Barron at the Washington Post, he said, you know, what are you going to do now that Trump's president? He said, I'm going to do my job. And that's, that's what we do. We just do our job. We understand what their job is, and we understand what our job is, and we just do it as best we can. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just like a good episode of Face the Nation, we are one hour on the dot. We're going to end it there. Thank you, Bob Schieffer.